Good evening, Namibia. We are three days away from deciding the future of our nation on 27 November. Today's show focuses on two main issues, corruption and the youth. Swapos Netumbo Nandindaitwa is hoping to become Namibia's first female president. Dr. Itula of the IPC is looking to build on his good performance in the previous election. Jobam Panda of AR is hoping to be seen as more than a potentially good anti-corruption commissioner. Bernanda Swatboy of LPM will be looking to foster more loyalty from his supporters than he had from Henny Sebeb. And McHenry Venani of PDM is fighting for the right to remain second. My name is Ashwin Berry, and it's time for Second Take. Stay informed as hashtag Namibia decides 2024. Save the CBG chatbot 264 Add to your contacts as Synergy Chatbot. Open the WhatsApp chat. Type elections. Click select here for more options and click manifestos. After that, select the party's manifesto that you would like to see. Hashtag Namibia Decides 2024. Sopos Netumbo Nandindaitwa enters the race with a historic twist. If elected, she'd be Namibia's first female president. She's saying all the right things. I will ensure that Swapo delivers on its promise of good governance and transparency. Noble goals. But does this mean we should forget fish rot, tender gate, and the corruption perception index that's on life support? Her big anti-corruption pledge is to strengthen institutions. But isn't this the same swap of that's been strengthening institutions for 34 years while corruption grew six packs? And then there's the youth policy. Swapo promises to create jobs and invest in skills development. But here's the thing. Namibia's youth unemployment rate is over 40%. We don't know the exact number, and it's hard to feel like that is not strategic, by the way. Swapo has had decades to fix joblessness. Why should people believe they'll start now? Why are they starting now? Of all the parties, Swapo's manifesto should be a resume that only describes what they have achieved in the last three decades with a few tweaks for the future. That is what is supposed to drive people to vote. You don't get to imagine a new Namibia with the rest of the political field because Namibia has always been in your hands, which sadly have not always been clean, but they have been steady, creating a sense of stability with some decent progress in certain areas. Perhaps Netumbo Nandindaitwa truly represents a new dawn for Swapo, a dawn in which all Namibian youth can wake up and go to work, creating and building dignified lives they can be proud of. A dawn that is not clouded by corruption. Let's talk IPC next. Enter Dr. Panduleni Itula, the IPC's maverick candidate who's still rocking his I'm not Swapo anymore badge like it's a medal of honor. Dr. Itula says the youth are the heartbeat of this nation and corruption is the cancer killing it. Strong imagery. He promises transparency, asset declarations and accountability. Great in theory, but the specifics? Missing in action, Dr. Itula declares we will uproot the roots of corruption from the soil of our nation. A poetic promise, but some might ask, are those roots from a tree that he helped plant during his swapo days, or is his vision truly organic? On youth empowerment, Itula is big on entrepreneurship and education reform. He claims we will unleash the potential of the Namibian youth. Unleash it into what though? The informal economy, startup culture, or just another batch of disappointed graduates. IPC wants the youth to be entrepreneurs, aka build your own business and stop asking us for jobs. They envision a Namibia where every young person is their own boss. Sounds great, until you realize not everyone wants or can afford to be an entrepreneur. What happens when 
Everyone is selling, but no one's buying. Entrepreneurship is only viable when there's access to capital infrastructure and markets. Otherwise, it's just motivational speaking dressed up as policy. Dr. Itula promises to reform education to better align with the needs of the economy. We will prepare the youth for the economy of tomorrow, he says. But what exactly does that mean? Will it be coding boot camps, advanced agriculture, or more PowerPoint slides about theoretical economics? IPC's youth policy has the right tone hopeful and idealistic. But much like AR, which we'll talk about just now, it needs more clarity. It's like a fitness plan with no workouts, you know what I mean? And uh, looking at IPC's youth focus, it's fresh, but let's hope it's not just a rebrand of old promises with better graphic design. AR's job on Panda doesn't mince words. He seems here for revolution, not reform. We will not negotiate with corrupt elites, he proclaims, hoping we never investigate his friend list, of course. It is admirable, but critics wonder if AR's no-compromise stance makes them more suited for protests than politics. On corruption, Amopanda promises to overhaul resource contracts and prosecute looters. Bold. But can AR's fiery rhetoric translate into actual policy? Because so far, it's all heat and no blueprint. As I said before, a lot of people think he would be better suited as an anti-corruption commissioner than a president. Is this because his stance is sturdy or because he does not feel presidential to the ordinary Namibian? And by presidential, I mean a unifier that can lead better than they can point fingers. For the youth, the AR says they will register all unemployed graduates for the purposes of job creation through a graduate intervention program. For unskilled labor, the AR government will introduce a series of public works that do not require skilled labor. This will particularly be introduced in rural areas and informal settlements where majority of unskilled labor resides. This is easy to like. The idea is noble. Give people jobs they can actually do. But let's unpack this. AR promises to introduce a series of public works that do not require skilled labor. Translation, digging trenches, patching roads, and other tasks that keep infrastructure limping along, but really build lasting wealth. And let's not ignore the emphasis on rural areas and informal settlements. Sure, that's where the unskilled labor force resides. But is this policy about empowerment or containment? Rural youth dreaming of progress might hear this and think, so I'm still building fences while urban elites sit in air-conditioned offices while creating jobs is commendable the strategy seems to imply you're unskilled and will make sure you stay that way where is the upskilling public works without training programs risk being little more than a government-sponsored hamster wheel people work but they don't move forward and what happens when the public works end? Do people return to their homes, newly unemployed, but with better pothole filling skills? If this policy isn't paired with a clear transition plan to higher value work, it's just temporary relief dressed up as vision. Public works projects can be valuable, but without a broader vision, they risk being busy work. Job on Panda and AR might call this empowerment, but critics could call it state-managed subsistence. AR could have fleshed out their manifesto more, but I guess the gaps will be filled by Ampanda's serial social media tweeting. Perhaps one can actually tweet their way into power. We'll see. LPM's Bernardo Swatboy is betting big on decentralization. Power must return to the people, he says. It's a compelling idea until you remember that most local governments are struggling to manage portals, let alone national policy. His anti-corruption promise involves independent commissions and a stronger judiciary. But if history has taught us anything, is that commissions often mean more bureaucracy, not less corruption. For youth, LPM talks about aligning education with regional economies. Great idea. But as Swatboy himself said in 2023, education without opportunities is a betrayal of the youth. So how do we avoid betrayal this time? LPM's focus on local solutions is admirable, but decentralization isn't a magic wand. It's more like a screwdriver, useful, but only if you know how to use it. 
The departure of Henny Sabeb is worth mentioning. The party branded him a colossal liability, celebrating his resignation like it was a national holiday, gleefully announcing their relief and newfound focus on values like dignity and honesty. Yet, this debacle spotlights what seems to be the party's ongoing leadership inconsistency. Bernardo Swatboy's fiery rhetoric and autocratic grip, which former insiders like Sabeb criticized, suggests a party still wrestling with internal harmony. All this being said, if LPM's manifesto is implemented effectively, it has the potential to bridge economic and social disparities between urban and rural areas, fostering more equitable national growth. They just have to figure out how to get along while doing it. Now, Mike Henry Venani is the pragmatist in the room. He promises to overhaul the ACC and make it truly independent. We cannot fight corruption with a toothless bulldog, he says. Fair point. But creating an independent body is one thing. Ensuring it works is another. The popular democratic movement, PDM, is navigating choppy waters as Dr. Itula's IPC threatens to turn their opposition crown into a souvenir. PDM's corruption policy proudly declares zero tolerance, but without concrete plans, it feels more like a strongly worded WhatsApp status than a blueprint for reform. On youth issues, their talk of job creation and education reform is commendable, but comes off like an uninspired control C, control V of Namibia's political cliches, leaving unemployed youth wondering if they've heard it all before. PDM risks becoming the well-meaning but outdated parent, insisting we're cool too. Yet their decades of experience as Namibia's opposition party could still be their lifeline if they can swap tired slogans for actual innovation. After all, in politics, legacy only matters if it still gets you invited to the dance. The question is, will PDM kwasa kwasa into relevance or do the cha-cha into obscurity? Joining me in studio is Irena Marie van der Vault one last time before elections as we talk about the build-up to 27 November. As promised, I'm talking to Irena Marie van der Vault, journalist with The Republican, as we head into elections 27 November. We've been having chats throughout the year and uh, we're three days away. How are you feeling? I'm feeling quite honored um, because obviously you've been having chats with a lot of journalists yes. for me to get the prime time prime spot time. on second take. <laughs> it's good to have you here. All right, let's get into it. Um, what's your take on the current atmosphere heading towards election? Um, I think in the newsroom we're very tired, but mm. I think in the next coming days, especially over the weekend, we're going to see a lot of excitement start to brew. Mm. I remember um, in 2019 in the elections, um, there was there was a lot of excitement mm. in places you wouldn't expect. I was in Swaziland at the time. Yes. You know, DRC. You were expecting people to be very serious mm. about. You know, I'm going to vote for change because those are the people who are most affected by what's going on mm. um, in that know, area. Exactly. All right. Yes. No. No. Certainly. I mean, excitement but that was is where palpable. The excitement was the big one. Yes. So, yes. Um, I I think we're going to in the next coming days see a lot of excitement from people. And mm, mm. um, I hope if you have not read the manifestos yet, read the manifestos. Mm. Votes informed. Yes. Make yes. an informed vote. Yes. Um, oh eight five seven eight five six two three one. Do save that number. Type in elections. Choose manifestos, and you can look at all the manifestos before you on vote. WhatsApp. Yes, on WhatsApp. Very essential. Yes. Um, look, the, the excitement is palpable. Uh, unfortunately, some of uh, some misinformation is swinging along with it, mm -hmm. particularly on the social media space. More than I've noticed prior in prior elections mm -hmm. in Namibia, which is someone panicking. I think so. If you were to ask me, if you. I mean, if you and I are going to play a soccer match, mm. I've never played soccer in my life. Mm. I'm not sure I could kick the ball. Mm. So the first thing I'm going to try to do is tell people that Ashwin should not be allowed to play this match mm. because X, Y, Z. X, Y, Z, yes. I'm going to try to discredit your eligibility mm. to do it in the first place. You might say he's played football with the British before. Exactly. Wink. <laughs> so um, that's, that's what I would do yes. if I was uncertain of my position and the chances that I would win that match. Yeah, absolutely. So 
for me, looking at that, that's someone trying to, and it might not be someone within the political parties. Mm. It could be supporters of said political parties mm. who really want their party to win. Uh, that, that's that's what it really looks it. like. I mean, I saw a video of uh, some alleged IPC supporters um, defacing um, LPM posters, but it was a juror wall, it was a wall, people... You know, it was five people with IPC shirts with just the logo on the back. So you could tell it wasn't IPC. They didn't show their faces and no one has their five posters put up on one wall, that kind of thing. So it's very uh, theatrical. Um, of course, it is worrying to feel that you need to de-campaign any other party. We do not know who's responsible for this. Yeah. And I believe all political parties have been victim yeah. to this in one way or the yeah. other. But what I wanted to focus on, um, Irena, is uh, what do you think is the weakest point for each of the leaders I'm going to throw at you? All right. Ooh. Just, just your opinion. Just your opinion. Okay. By the way, but whenever before we get it, to yes. that, I think on misinformation, an important one on the rise of misinformation and mm. disinformation is also AI. Yes. It's so much easier AI, to generate. Absolutely, absolutely. That is yeah. something to keep keep in keep in mind without yeah. a doubt. And we've seen how it has affected okay. other elections yeah. without a doubt. So Give me with your best shot. Let, yeah. Okay. So um, let's start. Let's start with Job and Panda. Um, I think that he is a radical. Mm. I think that because remember, our freedom fighters fought for democracy, mm. and he has this very like military esque mm. kind of thing about him. Mm. We're going to take it by force or by fire. Mm. So there's a lot of people who will like that about him, mm. and there's a, a lot of people who will dislike that about mm. him. You know, Namibia's kind of claim to fame and our you know freedom mm. fight and everything. Mm. It's all been about democracy. Mm. So if you have somebody like Jabba Mbanda with this like kind of I'll stage a military coup if I need to, mm. if you have a character like that, people aren't necessarily going to like that he's now challenging he that? the democracy. No, oh, but he has that, that like vibe oh, about okay, okay. him. Just, like, just wanted to clarify that. Don't want no, no, no. no he has not us. said that. Yeah. But um, he has the vibe about him that will take mm. it by force or by fire. Mm. So um, having someone as radical as that challenge something we've worked so hard at being mm. our democracy, mm. um, I think will count in his favor. Mm. But might also okay. So, so I mean, of course, um, on on his side, I'd assume that you know the radicalization is a direct uh, response to uh, the depth of what he feels is the decay uh, yes. of uh, Namibian institutions, um, which I guess does make sense. But you're saying that the perception well, would be that he's uh, more of an extremist, um, you know, yes, uh, in a way. and there's a chance he could. Uh, uh, get into authoritarian rule. He did lose um, one of his potent partners, uh, Dimbulikeni Naoyoma, at some point. Dimbulikeni uh, went to uh, head uh, a different campaign, which didn't make it to to the election, not because of Dimbulikeni. Yeah. But uh, some people assumed that that was possibly one of the reasons, you know, Ampanda's iron fist and he's just like, you know, he's uh, very rash. Is rash the right word? Direct? Um. Not right. I, I, I would go abrasive, with Rash. Perhaps. Yes. Possibly. I think I'd abrasive probably is, say a, abrasive. is a lot more. Is, all right. but, but then the question is, is he abrasive because of the things that Namibians don't like? Is he abrasive because of corruption, because of specific things? Or is he abrasive because he doesn't like the system of, as a whole and he wants to throw as it out? Oh, yeah. Because the system as a whole is built on the principles of democracy, yes. which Namibians tend to like, which yes. we fought very hard for. Well, yes. not me, I'm too young, but yes. the older generation, the middle-aged generation, this is what they fought for. This mm. is what they grew up being told was right. Mm. Um, so if Jabba Panda is going to walk in and say, I'm just going to throw the whole system out, mm. that would be a problem. That would be an issue. All right. Um, speaking of uh, radical leaders, at least in their demeanor, let's move over to Bernardo Swatboy. But not a swat boy, again, I think is that job of Mpanda thing where you are either going to love him and you're going to love his principles mm. or you're going to hate him. Mm. Um, where land reform is a conscientious issue. Yes. Giving people land just because you're you and I particularly like you mm. is going to be a conscientious a issue. Yes. Yes. So, I mean, I mean, without a doubt, land reform is something that, you know, takes a lot of thought yes. um, uh, to it, a lot of... Uh, intentional policy and in how yeah. you get it done. Uh, it does seem like we've got at least three parties whose um, core issue is land. Looking at the AR manifesto, I, I think land felt like a bit of a footnote. It wasn't 
as pronounced um, and perhaps this is uh, because of how people felt the AR handled things when they met with Dr. Hagaji Gengob, the late great Dr. Hagaji Gengob at, at that point where people feel like their original um, calling card was compromised. Um, so to speak. So we'll see how that goes. But land is a huge issue and landless people's movement are saying that's what they want to, to usher yeah. forward. Um, traditionally, his strength has been the south of Namibia. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that he has this defined weakness of not being able to connect to the north, just as Jobam Panda seems to have no ability to connect to the south? Mm, I think so. I think, And I think precisely because of those strongholds that the mm. other one has, I think mm. people in the north just resonate better with Jabba and Panda and people mm. in the south just I think that's just better. but do you think that's intentional the, the, like that that was their, their their core base they just started there and I mean you're trying to lead Namibia aren't you going to then branch out from where you get your core supporting base because um it's also not a coincidence um, Amopanda is an Awambo man yeah you know what I mean and and, and Bernardo's sort boy also comes from an indigenous yeah. community in the south so you know they are physical representations of the communities in yes. which they do have support um, has it just been a matter of trying to expand this core base um, from itself or to go outside and, and let the expansion uh, you know involve uh, mm -hmm. you know the the east west um, and so forth i think the reach of promotional materials for political parties has reached further in this right. election but i think it's a very tough thing mm. because when you are a political party you have to be very firm and very radical mm. in your beliefs mm. right so being very radical in ideas of land reform mm. for in the case of Bernardo Swatboy, um, isn't going to resonate as well in the central areas of the country where mm. we are living in Ventuk. And yes, people would like to own land. Yes, people would mm. like to own homes. But there is a consensus that the system right now, as it is, mm. Works for us because there's no better system. Has there been a successful mm. land reform policy? Well, I mean, that's the other thing. Only one party has been in power, and mm -hmm. and this is now what is very interesting, um, because you know that one party is obviously um, Swampo, um, and I would say over eighty percent of commercial mm -hmm. land is owned by white folks um yeah. and that's going to be an issue anyway on paper yeah. it's impossible for that not to be an issue so i could understand where the lpm ar and um NEF yes. are coming from with regards to trying to address that issue because as far as equity goes you know where we are when it comes to equality indexes as namibia we perform poorly yeah when it comes to equality press freedom Fantastic. In fact, that's why I have this show here. <laughs> <laughs> Press freedom, fantastic. Currently second, we can do better. We're usually first. Mm -hmm. uh, fantastic. So the, the land issue is a big one. They're just, just zoning in on LPM themselves. Um, last time, they looked like they were defined third. Mm -hmm. Is that going to be the case this time? Do you think they, they make that point? Because you see, it seems like IPC has cut some yeah. of their support. And it seems like Amopanda as AR might have taken some of that right. following not to mention um getting michael amshalelo amshalelo leaving do we did he leave with no one we don't know henny mm -hmm. sebeb goes to swapo back to swapo so to speak lpm celebrates it fair and fine mm -hmm. but did he also leave with some support i'm just wondering if you know they're on slightly weaker footing in this election what's what's your general perception on that just as concisely as possible mm, i think looking at the media mm -hmm. um around bernardo swap mm -hmm. boy around lpm mm -hmm. uh, leading up to this election it seems that they are on weaker footing. I don't know if that will translate. In we don't roles. know if it will translate. I mean, it's, if you look at the, at the special voting, it's, and like I, I see it, and it's fair to to pay attention to the special voting trends um, over the years. Yeah. But it's difficult to see it as as you know a significant percentage of what we can actually expect yes. on Wednesday. All right. So let's swing over to IPC now. Panduleni Tula. He is uh, he's on a roll. Um, he performed very well against uh, Dr. Hageji Gengob. It's now um, in Etumbo Nandi in Daitwa uh, with the IPC. For the most part, we only know his name and Trevino Forbes. We're not really clear on the entire structure. Of course, the names are there, the parliamentary list. You can also find them um, on 0857856231. Um, but uh, looking at IPC, they look like they're gaining momentum. Yes, they definitely have. And I think it, it starts in the previous election. Mm. Um, even they built the, on that. Yeah. Even in the last election, um, I was an intern, mm. so I was too afraid to say it then. But, <laughs> um, 
I think the last election was not about Itula becoming president, becoming the first independent candidate to be mm -hmm. president. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at, um, you know, what he was saying, it wasn't about then. It was the issues. It was about building the foundation. Mm. You know, he didn't say, um, you know, you have to vote for me this time mm. and why and why and why. It was more of a sensational, like, this is my face, this is my name, this yes. is who I am. I'm a dentist. I'm a, An introduction. A dentist, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> Um, well, I'm a dentist, I, you know, I'm yes. this old and I'm, I'm so There's smart. an introduction, his introduction onto the political scene, but his issues resonated, particularly if you look at the mm -hmm. coast where he essentially cleaned out um, uh, the ruling party. So we're going to see what he's going to manage to do. A lot of the misinformation we've been seeing has been directed towards IPC, which is possibly telling off something, a larger threat than most people would have mm -hmm. seen. So we'll see how that goes. But right now, a person I can tell he's a direct threat to is McHenry Venani with regards to the PDM, do you think the PDM can realistically expect to remain the opposition party after this election? I I think it's going to be tight between IPC and the PDM. Mm. Um, because, not IPC and Swapo? Mm, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't really know where to class Swapo at this point because even if you look at the coast last time around um, at Irongo region, they were the region that were most hit by um, the breaking of the fish rod story, mm. right? So for it was fresh in their memory at the time. And the question is, how many people are going to have forgotten come this election, election. about fish rod? Because those well, issues I mean, you just have reminded deepened. Them, Mariana, so. <laughs> <laughs> those issues have deepened. You know, Definitely. the IDPR released uh, two reports on the human rights impact. Mm. People aren't able to get jobs. Mm. Um, it was, but it was fresh then. It was sensational it, it was then. It was at that new point then. In time. It still hurt then. Yeah. So it would it would make sense to me that people who were planning to vote Swapo in the beginning of 2019 mm. would have looked elsewhere yeah. after that story had broke. Do you know what I think might be a telling sign of, of uh, PDM not potentially not holding on to that position? I just spoke about IPC briefly mentioned Swapo and the conversation became about them. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? The PDM, there was just because they, they just hasn't been enough potency to speak of in this particular mm -hmm. run to elections. But again, PDM might appeal to that audience that's looking at land issues. Land because issues? Because they've had that, that case in the High Court yes. against, um, I believe it was uh, Rashid Sadrov. Mm. Sadrov, his surname is definitely Sadrov. Uh -huh. Um, this is terrible. I actually wrote about <laughs> <that> <laughs> you, wrote case. Was, you wrote about it. Yeah. Um, no, they've been look. They have been pragmatic yeah. at all points, and and um, I think they have been a more or less consistent opposition. Um, let's see if they can, you know, be a formidable one yeah. because they will need to be one in order yeah. to, you know, maintain their opposition or to win. We don't know how yeah. this goes. Uh, sorry, Irene, our time is running out. We have to talk about the ruling party. Menetumbo um, Nandin mm -hmm. Do you know DJ Maporisa? No, I don't know. Okay, so obviously you are not at the rally. <laughs> Turns out it's a little difficult to market to Namibians using South Africans. Who knew? But anyway, let's talk about very briefly. Oh, wait, I do know that. You, ah, so yeah, you just came through. Did, All right, okay, why didn't you go to the rally? Because you're a journalist. Fair enough. So let's talk about um, the ruling party. Tough time for them. As I said earlier on the show, in my opinion, their manifesto should be the resume of the work that they have already done. Um, they don't get to just, you know, to be like, oh, new Namibia, we want to do, but you've always, you know, had the power. However, they do have created a semblance of stability um, mm -hmm. that Namibia is, we're not sure Namibia is ready to, you know, to let go of, you know, so to mm -hmm. speak. At the same time, you cannot ignore the corruption. Um, you cannot ignore the ties with uh, Zimbabwe. Um, you can't because, the, you know, a lot of the people who have been accused of corruption in Zimbabwe have been on stages um, uh, for Swapo. How are they going to consolidate all of this? Mainly because, and I'm going to put this out there, I believe um, Swapo doesn't just need to win. They need to win well because I... Just putting it out there, my analysis is it's going to be fairly difficult for Mena Tumbo's uh, campaign for second term. So how you win now is what you're going to build off in the next four years. Just yeah. quick words on Swapo from you. I think Swapo has been very open, you know, speaking at, at public events, talking about the dwindling majority. Mm. Uh, do I think there's a real chance they'll still have the majority? Mm, probably, you don't, yes. probably yes, but we Maybe. don't know. We but don't also, know. I think it, it very strongly depends. Swapo is known to have a stronghold in the O region, yes. up far north. Mm. And that's also the, the, pop, the populace that we believe doesn't feel very good about women in positions no, of right. leadership. Yes. So are those two at odds with each other? Well, I, I mean, you, they're united under the banner. 
you know, and, and I guess that's the thing. And Menetumbo has to play that in the sense that on one end, she wants to separate herself from the negative legacy of Swapo, but she has to capitalize or leverage the legacy of Swapo as well mm -hmm. um, in order to continue to appeal to the people. We don't know if they will have a majority, but I was just saying that if they do win, they need to win well. Um, and it looks like a, a well-contested political field. What are your thoughts on that statement? I truly, I know Swapo, if they win, they, they have to win well. But at the same time, if they don't win well, that means a stronger opposition. That means a stronger opposition to keep them in check post-election. More questions, always essential. Thank you, Iriana, for joining us. Iriana Marie van der Valt, ladies and gentlemen, 27 November, Namibia decides. Your choice, your vote. <music>